pre-starting announcement. Um, hi, I was sitting in the seat over there and my green jacket mysteriously disappeared. So if anyone happens to see it, please let me know. Or if you see a jacket that you don't really know where it came from, please let me know. Thank you. Okay. No, but I, could, uh, I turned off the fans because it was kind of cold in here. So we're learning the building user interface. Uh, okay, welcome back. We're going to talk about um, input uh, devices and some really interesting techniques and some things that are a little hardware related, but also important to HCI researchers. We're also, uh, we're not going to use the overflow for the afternoon session, um, but we are sort of debugging things and recording stuff. So in the future, if you show up and the room's full, then we will have that available to you. So um, I want to look at, I promised from the beginning in the morning that I would look at a couple of these design one assignments uh, that that people had worked on. Is uh, Lara here? I want to show just, a, just really briefly, if you remember, just a couple small insights that I thought were pretty nicely done on some of these. So for this particular one, um, what I thought was really uh, what was really interesting is uh, she did a really nice job kind of interviewing people. And there's, I'm not going to read the entire description, but uh, she went and looked at people at, I think, RSF that were doing fitness. And she really drilled into them about opportunities for them to use a watch as a device. And that she talked to them explicitly about when are moments during the sessions that you're holding in terms of where you might not want to pull your phone out or walk over to it. And so she, she basically got some really good insights into that. And mainly the kind of process that she used of really questioning them revealed things around uh, how they want to do timings and also things with music and the workout. I thought that was really um, nicely done. Uh, this is another one that... Um, so is Noah here? So you find out. OK. So this one, actually, I thought was interesting because the prototyping was unusual. And again, uh, th this, this, whoa, did I fall off? I didn't touch anything here. OK, I have no idea what just disconnected. What happened? <laughs> yeah, wow. Hold on, S stand by. Oh, I can tell the projector's totally off. It's like something I can just tell by looking at it. Hold on. It's like somehow the drilling on the roof affected the actual like screen. Okay. Hopefully we come back. Oh no. Sorry about that. 
think it's coming back now. I see it about to come up. Okay, back. So it's warming up. Um, let me scroll over to that side. Okay, so th the point I want to make about this particular uh, project was he actually had some insights. Uh, he interviewed basically some individuals, uh, like someone that was doing uh, some, some cooking and some other applications, someone who was a CEO. And the design that he ended up sort of prototyping, I think it's shown again here at the bottom, was a, a watch that looked much like the smart watches we're talking about, but an insight about maybe you'd have something on the bottom part of the wrist this might be an uh, interesting interface as well. So you might look at it like this or look at it underneath. So you think about it on even smartwatches that are mostly sold to us today, it's all about this little screen. We don't talk about the band or the parts of the band you could interact with. So it was interesting from a design perspective that you could also use that. Um, and, and one other, let's see who's, this is um, Kenneth. Okay, uh, this one, uh, there was a really nice interview about uh, different usages, and I wanted to mainly point out some ways that, that he talked about designing the actual flow, and so a lot of you did this, but this is a particular nice way to sort of at least lay out how the screen interaction would work, and they were all prototyped out to fit into that form factor. Just a, a nice way to kind of visualize it, and then also use that in the user studies. Okay, let's come back to actual input devices. And the one thing I promised you was we would get a chance uh, when there's certain uh, time, and I think we can kind of fit in a little bit of it now, to talk about some things that you put on Piazza that you wanted to critique. Okay, so we'll look at them really briefly and then we'll talk about them and we can use some of the sort of ways that we think and the new techniques we've learned about HCI to talk about that. So here's, um, is uh, Casey here? All right, this is suggested by him. Yeah, Pyro Watch. Okay, what do we think of Pyro Watch? What's going on here? Very high marks for flame, but... Yeah, exactly. You have, if you, you have to... Um, uh, you're using all your hands to basically actually get it to light up. So what if you were, I don't know if it's you're lighting, I guess, maybe a cigarette or something, but I mean, at any trade, you have no extra free hand to do anything. So you could possibly look cool, like lighting your own maybe, but it's a very awkward positioning. Um, yeah, what else? Yeah, think about even if you wanted to light a candle, for example, you kind of, I mean, normally you'd have something, right? And you'd sort of reach down maybe into a little thing to light it. Now, how are you going to get your hand in there? And, you know, it's just not going to work as well. Clearly, it's like a crazy thing. What else? I 
<laughs> right. High points for looking like you're living dangerously, but low points for HCI. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So times where you actually you don't need extra hands, like lighting a stove, that could that could work. Or it's true, it's very unlikely that you're going to end up out going, "Oh, I don't have a lighter." Uh, in fact, you'll be the person that like people go, "You have a light?" Like, no, I see on your wrist. Okay, fine. Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, yeah, so just it was it was more funny than anything. But uh, let's look at another one. So this is by Richard you here. Yay! Okay. So this was on Reddit, is that right? I think that was it. So what do we think of this design? What are your thoughts? We need it, we hate it, I don't want it. All right, yeah, one at a time. It, I'm sorry, it fits the cup? Yeah. So okay. So clearly, some things are going on. It's it's uh, how can you? What is the minimal materials you can sort of design around that carry in a balanced way the ultimate meal of champions? I guess I don't know what that is exactly. Um, but what are what are some problems? Because it actually is quite. I think all of us agree it's very clever. It's kind of a very kind of tight design in terms of just a flat piece of material that kind of folds up, and you got this nice way to carry everything. Yes. Right, so the weight might not actually work out correctly. In fact, they, they kind of don't show you it really in motion. This is always like a little bit like, it looks great, but then if you picked it up, maybe it's misbalanced. And then if it's misbalanced, what happens to your drink? Who knows? Yeah. All right, sorry, I'm feeding back somehow. Uh, yeah, so, right. The, the drink holder, he's saying, could be improperly sized in terms of for carrying the drink. Also, it now locks you in. You could only carry one size beverage. Smaller than that, not going to really work. Too much larger than that, not going to work. So that's a fair critique. Yes. <laughs> the fries are exposed to the liquid. Yeah, uh, it's possible that any spillage would, would just damage those precious fries, possibly. Yeah, the way it's set up, that's fair. Yeah. Right, so it's not general purpose that you would just say, I got, I got extra fries. You're sort of, if you come and you just want a burger and no fries, please bring counterweight material to like operate this mechanism. So it, it kind of does require, it works in this balanced way. Okay, yeah, another comment? Oh, that's true, right, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, so the food actually, because it's sort of exposed, if you have to travel a long distance, it's gonna be more exposed, it'll cool off. Those glorious fries will be, I don't know, cooled down and then no good. So that it'd only be for sort of short distances. Okay. So we also had a so I, I, we also had a suggestion to look at. I think many of you might have seen when it was a couple of weeks ago. Apple released a new kind of OS and new kind of tools and a bunch of hardware. They also talked about 3D Touch, which we mentioned in class a couple of weeks ago. Um, so. Let's look at that a little more carefully through an HCI lens, and I'm going to play the little Apple promo video, and then we'll talk about it. With iPhone and multi-touch, we introduce a whole new way to interact with technology. Tapping, swiping, and pinching have forever changed the way we navigate and experience our digital world. Until now, these gestures have been defined by a series 
singular plea in two-dimensional space. For my phone 6S and 6S Plus, we're introducing an entirely new interaction and a whole new dimension to the way you experience your iPhone. It's made possible by a technology called 3D Touch. This is the next generation of multi-touch. Along with recognizing familiar gestures, my phone also recognizes force, enabling new gestures, peak and pop. works on the home screen, giving you shortcuts to the things you do frequently. It also works inside applications themselves. You press the menu, and it gives you a peek at the content. You continue pressing, and it pops you into the content itself. Sensors embedded in the display will read how hard you're pressing and react in a smooth, linear way. This is a dynamic system deeply integrated into iOS 9. You can dip in and out of where you are without losing the sense of your context. It provides distinct tactile feedback for your actions, letting you know exactly what you've done and what to expect. While the way that you use 3D Touch is simple, the engineering behind it is some of our most advanced. At its heart, our capacitive sensors integrated into the backlight of the Retina HD display. With each press, these sensors measure microscopic changes in the distance between the cover glass and the backlight. These measurements are their combined signals from the touch sensor and accelerometer to provide fast, accurate, and continuous response to finger pressure. For a truly communicative experience, we had to develop a more precise level of haptic feedback. While the vibrating system on a typical phone requires 10 or more oscillations to reach power, the tactic engine in the iPhone 6X reaches peak output in just one cycle and stops just as quickly. This allows us to create also more distinct feedback events, like a heat tap lasting just 10 milliseconds and a full tap which lasts 15 minutes. Perhaps more than any other system of design. 3D Touch is a clear example of how hardware and software developed together can work to define a simple experience. This is the next generation of Multi Touch. It means this iPhone, the most advanced iPhone we've ever created. Okay, you probably all saw that before, but now we're on the same page. We've seen the promo literature about that. What, what's our sort of reaction of, of what this is? I mean, how, how do you look at this in terms of what's good or what's bad or what are the kind of things that it, yeah. Right. So even discovering what's available, it's hard to figure that out because, like you said, you have to explore around what things can you kind of provide, what things can you use this force touch on? Is it all features of a screen? I mean, they partially, I would claim that's why the video is a little long because they want to make sure that you see all of them because if they just said, yeah, you can push on things and there's get other features, people would go, what, what kind of feature? What do you mean? So they're showing you things like that. Yeah, so hard to discover the visibility of the interface. So we talked about that. This is one of those things where we might be back in this 
class five years from now going, oh, that's now a metaphor everyone understands. But this is an example of something that's so new, they have to put all kinds of little hooks and affordances for you to try to figure out what that is and how to discover it. So that's, that's definitely true. Right. So you're saying when you just if you if you grab some device, we'll say it's your phone, but it could be anything, you're gonna have to have learned experience of now about how hard you're pushing. So when you start to touch it. Right, so they at least show you would, un, un, if you look, it's actually, um, you move through states. So you wouldn't just come down really hard and be right into that, um, one of those deeper uh, high force states. You kind of have to tap, then push deeper, then push deeper. So at least they've made it so there's a staging so that you wouldn't just drop all the way into that mode. Um, but you're right, it's still, now this is a new learned experience. It even reflects back on stuff from this morning about now is this power law of practice. People are going to have to do this repeatedly and start to learn this new kind of uh, uh, sort of body motion, this new kind of kinetic action for an interface we're unfamiliar with. Um, it'll, yeah, so there's ha these two thing points you right away got made about discovery of what interfaces and what objects on the interface even accept that. Remember when we were looking at some of these uh, metaphors before and it was can you touch the bird and can you touch the clock and so they this is opens up this big question about what things uh, do respond to force touch or 3d touch as they call it yeah yes Oh, right. That's a good point. So he's saying, if you remember for at least Apple OS, if you're holding down on an icon for, it's not about the, the force as much as the time you hold down. So it's more of a temporal rather than a force, but still they're very similar in the setting because you're going to still be holding down with a force over a given time period. You could trigger it into this mode, which is now delete uh, or reshuffle or move them around. So I actually, I'm not sure how they handle that on this. I don't have the device either. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, so there's definitely good things to this. It's not that this is bad. I mean, it's good that you guys are being critical. I, I, that's definitely the right questioning to think about where the edge conditions, things that don't work right, or the mappings that are inconsistent. Um, but this is, we briefly mentioned this like two weeks ago when someone asked me, but in terms of this class, this is one of these, it's, it's, it's a mode selection, right? It's, it, I would say it's a, a quasi mode. It's one of these spring loaded modes that you, you don't accidentally get into. You're, you're actually holding with your finger down, much like if you're holding the shift key, you don't forget that you're in shift mode because you're actually, there's muscle memory that you're, there's a muscle involved. So similarly, it's a quasi mode that actually takes advantage of, you know, fits law, right? So we have targets put up right close by to where it knows your finger is. So it's a lot of things you already learned in HCI. So it's almost, if someone says, hey, what's 3D touch? You go, oh, it's, it's another one of those quasi modes that takes advantage of fits law, right? Like, what? Like, yeah, you know, take 160, you'll be into it. It's cool. Um, but it's, it's, it's using things you already know. Um, it's just they decided that the technology is there to try to implement this because uh, they can actually do... Uh, the right precision of detection and things like that. Um, how new is this? Have we have you guys seen something like this before? Yeah. 
Yeah, so there were touch pads on a lot of devices, including, as he mentions, Windows machines that did respond to force. Um, so I just sort of found a couple things that I knew about. This was about 10 years ago. This was a piece of research that was published that was saying uh, this is actually a thing called Glimpse. And at the time, it was like, hey, maybe we could have this novel input mechanism where you you push down, and if you push further, then you can activate other modes of interaction. So same same idea. Um, uh, there was even a little bit of work before that thinking about how you can combine force with the intended action. It's going to show you a little video of that. In this video, we introduced pressure marks and strokes for the variations in pressure made it possible to indicate both a selection and an action simultaneously. Selection and actions are common interactions in most graphical user interfaces. However, these interactions are often separated in time. For example, user does a selection and then indicates an action. By assigning a meaning to the variations of pressure within a stroke, we can specify scope and action in a concurrent fluid motion. We investigate four types of pressure marks. Low, 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 high, 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 and high, low. It is relatively straightforward to browse through marks when they do not overlap in space, such as in this finding. Hi, menu. Marks can overlap in space, thus taking traditional approaches that lay out options in X, Y space, not appropriate. Instead, we propose a semi-sequential browsing node that lets users discover the set of available pressure marks. After the system detects a noticeable pause in the user's interaction, it shows graphical feedback that reveals available pressure marks to the user. From that point, users can mimic the display profile if they want to, or cancel the interaction by dictating. Pressure marks can be used independently of the relative orientation of the user and the display. Since the action relates to the variations in pressure, it really doesn't matter from where a user engages the screen. We believe this property makes pressure marks compelling for collaborative tabletop scenarios where there is no prescribed user screen orientation. Pressure marks can enhance existing interaction techniques, as is the case of simple pressure marks. Or pressure fanning, to, for example, expand the pile in ascending or the sending order. In conclusion, we presented pressure marks, marks where we assign a meaning to the variations in pressure within. User studies have shown them as a viable interaction technique, as well as capable of being faster than current state-of-the-art sequential selection action techniques. Okay, so you get this is something that's a little bit different, but I thought it was interesting to show where they're saying, now what if pressure also encodes the action you want? So you select something, if you want to copy, you sort of give it more pressure at the end stroke, or if you want to uh, cut, you do a different operation. You have to, the usual things come in, like how hard is that for someone to learn? Is this something that is actually, people can do accurately? And so really the studies that they did are trying to at least initiate that discussion about what's possible and how um, error prone is this. Here's even another uh, system from about 15 years ago that was really close to this idea that we saw just um, in the 3D touch. It's pop through mouse button interactions. It was, well, what if your mouse had this kind of pressure motion and you could actually um, pop and do other uh, interactions. So in this, they actually, uh, I wrote down something funny because it, it talks about these older types of applications. They had, um, They made it so that uh, when you went to a URL and you pushed it, basically, you could either w pushing it lightly brought you to the URL. If you pushed it harder, then it brought up other options for you. So very similar to what that was. And if you want to go further back, here's actually 96. There's a patent on doing this, actually. So these ideas, when you see them, um, they're somewhat exciting, but be aware that there's a ton of people who have looked at this for a long time before. This patent had one odd sort of situation, if I read it correctly, which is that they're actually locked states. So you sort of push the mouse down, it would lock into a different mode. So it's not a quasi mode, and then you'd be in another state as you use the mouse. Um, and they kind of showed that here, and then you'd push it down again, and you'd be in a different state. So it's, it's a little bit different conceptual model. 
but it had that same idea. Okay, let's go on and talk about input devices. 3D Touch is sort of one of them, this extension from how we can start to do 3D or how we can look at input devices. But the key questions we want to ask when we're, so the one thing that's a little different is we're going to talk slightly more about kind of hardware and intention of different input devices. And so what you want to ask as an HCI practitioner is what people are trying to do, what this input device that you're using or the choice, what are the things that it's capable of or not capable of, or where does it perform well or not well, and what kinds of interactions are more encouraged by it or discouraged. Now, you also want to think about what are going to be the most common types of tasks people do. Usually, not always, but usually people enter text. Um, and they also do pointing, marking, these other tasks as well. You might want to draw. It depends on your application. So you have to take these into account in terms of choosing the input device. Or if you don't have a choice, you're going to have to figure out how, if you really have to draw lines and you're using a particular input device that makes that difficult, how you're going to design the user experience to support that. So we'll talk about text entry because it's so common. Um, so one thing is, <clears throat> essentially, you usually end up with an array of some discrete inputs like a keyboard. And people can choose a lot of different uh, layouts of how to do this. You're familiar with different kinds. Uh, and we talked about it this morning about how there's this power law of practice that people learn to actually type at, over, over time. And that, that increases their word count, and their speed, and also the accuracy. Most of the keyboards that you're familiar with are sort of two-handed, right? So here's common examples. So what are things that are good or bad about keyboards? What are important elements of a keyboard design? What would you say? Yes. Spacing between the keys, right? So you want some kind of natural uh, kind of uh, distance from where your fingers would normally rest, right? Too wide, it feels un unnatural. And it can be very subtle if you've gone into some stored, you start looking at keyboards, you go, whoa, this one feels really tight. And it's really um, can make a difference in terms of speed. What other things about keyboards are important properties? Right, so the feedback, the tactile sensation of actually pushing the key down. So even, sometimes that even includes the sound. So at least in some early, when they first brought computers into places like uh, workspaces and there, people were used to hearing the mechanical typewriters and it didn't sound like anyone was doing work because it was too quiet so they had to add there was actually a key click mode that you would turn on so it'd make all these sounds what else key shape yes so exactly so how it's shaped and your finger rests on it yeah how it feels I, i'll just i think you're kind of hinting at another one which is just that you can feel it at all right so at least one of these is projected keyboard you can't feel at all. Um, the obvious advantages are they're trying to say anything can be a keyboard surface, and it projects this out. But it's very hard to be lined up on the keyboard, right? So also about handedness and how easy it is to input. So here's just some other pictures of different handedness keyboards. I don't, I don't know how many people use many of these. I've seen people that once they do this, they're addicted to some of these. And then we, we, we all have these different layouts of keyboards, which I think you're aware of. I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone knows this, but I mean, the early or most common, this QWERTY keyboard is really designed from a mechanical constraint. And that is that early typewriters that actually had a mechanical linkage for striking the page. These are designed to actually slow you down so that common letters that come in sequence actually don't get hit on the same side of the um, patent because they'll actually, they can get jammed. So it's a little bit designed so that you're a slave to the machine in some sense. And then the Dvorak is, is aligned more to help with commonly used letters are aligned for more frequent, um, uh, they're sort of positioned in places where fingers have more dexterity. Who uses uh, Dvorak? Some, there's usually some people that do. No one? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so, Let's talk about mobile devices. So I don't know if it, how many people still remember T9? This is fading, right? Who used to T9? Woo, T9, yeah. 
All right, that'd be cool, like have an old T9 party, like come bring your T9 device. Okay, so let's talk about, so there's a couple different things. You can do text entry using a kind of on-screen keyboard, so a soft keyboard, which I'll come to in a second. You can do handwriting recognition, you can do graffiti, you can do other types of uh, technologies that I'll show an example of. So the world of T9, I think everyone remembers, but you had to actually use a sequence of presses to move through this mapping of the letters on the screen. Um, so it was slow, it was sped up through some autocomplete where it did some uh, suggestions of what you were trying to write, right? So that helped things out. But it was also quite slow. And it's clearly one of those moments where they said people want to write messages, it's a phone, in phone world we dial with numbers, and so numbers were the law of the land. That was the input device, and clearly that's, if you observe how much you used your phone and how much you actually used the numbers to call, that's probably minuscule compared to how, much other thing, how many other things you do. You also want to think about the handedness. So this is the Twiddler. This is a chordal keyboard. Who's used a chordal keyboard? Probably no one. Yeah, so the way this works is you hold down a particular sequence, all of them at the same time, and you release. And that will actually allow you to type a letter. So this is not a full keyboard like A, B, C, D, but A would be holding down, you know, three of the keys in, in, in sequence, you release them, that's A. Then you hold down two, that's a B. There's a way to do this. And you can do it in one hand, okay? So that's what's cool about this. You saw this before on the first day of class. These guys are all holding chordal keyboards. They're holding little twiddlers. There's a twiddler with our friend Thad Starter that went on later to do Google Glass right on the end. He's holding it. There they are again, holding their chordal keyboards. These are people, and, and, and Thad is one of the only people I know that can just type so much faster than me on that chordal keyboard. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, but also, chordal keyboards were envisioned further back than that. Our friend Doug Engelbart, which we haven't had a lot of time to spend, uh, but he's the one who did the mother of all demos back in 1968. He also invented the mouse um, and, and teleconferencing and uh, just hyperlinks, everything that we'll get to later. But one thing he said is, hey, you know this thing you're all excited about, the mouse? And they always hear about, oh, he made this mouse. He also said, we're not going to have... We're gonna have this chordal keyboard. See this chordal thing he's got over here? That's his vision for the future. What happened? We don't have that. We got the mouse, we didn't get this thing. This thing didn't come through. So it was just a little too much uh, and the mapping was a little odd for people and it was hard to learn. The mouse was a lot more intuitive. You could see this pointing device. So a little bit more on mobile phones and keyboards, and I, everyone sort of struggle with these, so let's just try to talk through what the issues are. So the most common thing is to have a soft, software-based keyboard. These are keyboards that the software generates the actual keyboard, and most mobile devices have this. It sort of appears or disappears. Um, what are some of the benefits and drawbacks of this? What do people think? What's good, what's bad? Yes. Oh, yeah, so the fat finger problem, that's true. So actually lining up on the keys, knowing that's, that's some issue for sure, yeah. Right, so you can hide it when you don't need it. That's key because the other keyboard, like when you're typing on T9, you couldn't get rid of that. So you can actually customize it. In fact, you could bring up things that, in this case, it's showing you, well, maybe you want to enter .net, .edu, .org. So you actually can customize it so it's very flexible for context of use. If you had a regular keyboard, they don't have those keys on it, so that's nice. Yeah, so language, it, could, it easily adapts to different contexts and languages. These are all really good points. What's something uh, maybe bad about it? Maybe it's sort of hinted at, actually, so. Um. 
Right. You can't feel it. It's hard. You actually need to usually have hand-eye coordination. Um, it's very rare that you can just, you know, pull your phone out and just... Oh, I didn't mean to send that. Right? That's what happens. All right. Uh, you had one more comment? or Yes. Right, so there's a design challenge where you bring this up, you're going to sacrifice some of your screen real estate, and this is a little bit back to what we talked about this morning. If you suddenly, and you've probably had this happen, where it's type something in, and you, there was some, maybe a question or something, and part of that scrolls off the screen. And now, you've basically set up this cognitive load for people to remember something. As a designer, you thought, well, the question will be right there, and you didn't take into account that, well, when this keyboard comes up, now they can't see that. They're going to have to remember more than their seven plus or minus two chunks. They're not going to be able to do that, and that's, that's kind of what's happening with that cycle. There's also um, usually no feedback. So when you're, when you're tapping, unless you have a little audio click turned on, there's, you don't feel the clicking that we mentioned before with other keyboards. We should at least look back historically at what other people have done. So this is, do folks know what this is? People, maybe? Kind of? This is, this is, no guesses? The Newton, yes. This is the Apple Newton. Uh, this is the very early, Apple's first foray into a kind of small, kind of tablet or pad kind of device. And you would actually, their, their approach was, at the time, handwriting was very hard to do. People used other techniques for text entry. And Apple said, no, you're just going to write, and then it's going to pause for a second and then give you this back. It was error prone for sure. And that created a bad user experience. At the same time, a more successful product was the Palm Pilot, which used graffiti. So it was a little bit of a cheat. They said, yeah, handwriting, too hard to do, but let's force people to use our own alphabet. And then we'll make it, we'll design this alphabet so it's easy for a computer to recognize and we'll remove all those ambiguous situations of is it a D or an O or an I or an L. Um, so this was the actual alpha. If you look for an A, you just kind of started, you went up and down, that was it. That was enough to tell it was an A. You can kind of see the letters. Um, Someplace in my long-term memory is this alphabet. I can write in this because I used this device back in the day. Um, but the disadvantage was that you actually um, had to learn this new sequence. At the time, people would actually do, it was very nerdy, people would actually graffiti, like real graffiti with spray paint in this weird <laughs> font. Let's look at another um, version of that called Edge Write. Probably a little less familiar. It wasn't so commercially used. But the idea was to exploit the edges, because one thing that's hard is when you're writing the scale of how large you're writing, or also getting the, the marks lined up. So this was um, Jake Walbrack, who's now faculty at University of Washington. When he was at Carnegie Mellon back um, many years ago, he and um, some other colleagues came up with this idea of edge write that you would actually, if you look, all it's put in there is a little piece of acrylic cut out of like a laser cutter. And the idea is that you will just use the edges and that will be enough to actually um, write. Now, what do you think the advantages of using such a system are? So people that have trouble with dexterity, first of all, because you can actually just follow the edge. It's easier to follow an edge condition. So I'll show you a sh very short little video. Not sure if he narrates it or not. The new in a study of novice users who had never written in receipt or edge edge was 18% more accurate during text entry, with no significant difference in speed or learnability. The motivation for developing a more accurate, more physically stable means of text entry came from work with 
people with notice impairments. People with cerebral palsy, like Parkinson's, for example, often exhibit a good deal of a tremor, making graffiti impossible to use. By comparison, EdgeWrite allows the user to move her stylus in a more stable fashion by putting pressure against the edges and into the corner. Many of our subjects with motor impairment were entirely unable to use graffiti, but they could use EdgeWrite without much difficulty. What's more, many assistive technologies cost hundreds or thousands of dollars and require extensive customization and configuration. EdgeWrite can be added to a conventional handheld like this Palm PDA, simply by adding the plastic overlay and the edge rate software. Let's take a quick. All right, so you get the idea. Uh, let's look at this as um, another version, which now you've seen lots of these keyboards available. With my finger still on the phone. All right, we don't have to hear the whole narration, um, but. I think you've seen keyboards like this where now you actually just your your hand travels and you sort of slightly pause you don't even lift up so it's not as if you're tapping the intuition is this obviously increases speed because you can sort of move between them um, and then they're trying to show you the accuracy of it and now of course you've seen this movement towards loading your own keyboards onto phones specifically to customize it for you Okay, so in terms of mobile text entry, we people have basically developed these custom sets that work great in improving accuracy, but they're obviously challenging. You have to learn new things. Um, and it's, it's hard for people to kind of read these when they're like that. So a question that you might obviously ask is which of them is sort of the fastest? And people have done a lot of, again, empirical studies to look at this. And one way to actually look is novice users versus expert users, because that's a big part of how you might think about uh, any kind of input device. Um, and as you can imagine, keyboard sort of follows what you'd, what you'd normally kind of get. People, after some time, become a lot faster, you know, 70 words per minute. Uh, the soft keyboard has a more dramatic uh, sort of curve. This often because there's a lot of more kind of assisted autocomplete and things. Um, and it just likewise, it still shows that the keyboard kind of dominates because it allows a really flexible and it's got a, it plays into the dexterity of your, your hands rather than smaller uh, keyboards. And you can see that on these watches, they've kind of just punted. No one's putting big keyboards on them because it's just too challenging. So what do they do? Well, we do speech with Google Voice or Siri or whatever your favorite speech device is. Um, you can actually talk quite quickly, and it'll. And you can, I don't know if you played with these techniques. I mean, there's devices on almost all of our uh, computers. You can just narrate into them. But the problem is, you realize that speech is really different than than sort of typing. When you're talking, it's hard to actually speak in a way that you possibly want to compose something written to someone. If you if you you probably tried it to some limited extent. I mean, I've tried sometimes talking and you just I have to re-edit things because you actually speak in a way that's not consistent with how you would write something. Um, and also the usual things we've talked about several times in here is first of all correcting errors is really hard. So when you're typing you kind of see these errors you can kind of you're on the keyboard so you can back up and kind of interact with it. When you're speaking it's hard to say go back to that word that looks that was supposed to be graduate and it's granulate and sort of change that to graduate. Now go back it's like very hard to interact with that kind of a system. And then we always talk about this awkwardness. It's one thing um, if you're in some setting that's more private, but having these conversations, how's it going? What's going on with your um, watch or other device, especially if it's information that's considered not personal or that's very personal or something that's awkward to share, um, or it's just socially not acceptable to be sort of talking to yourself like that. Let's look at something else that's a really common feature as an input device, pointing devices, and just look a little deeply at how even um, these systems work. So um, this is our sort of friend, again, the, one of the, this is the first mouse that our friend Doug Ingebart and English, uh, Ron English did in 1964. Um, you can go see it at the Computer History Museum. So that's very awesome that you can do that. And then if you look, these are sort of some other kinds of, if you think about 
even an older mouse, it's important as an HCI researcher to try to understand what the actual physical mechanism is and how it actually is designed to take input in. Now, you don't always end up doing this, but often it's important to know that because that might influence the issues of how you design your actual interface. So often it's good to know how it works. Now, older mice would actually, if you took them apart, who's taken a mouse apart before? Yeah, there's plenty to take apart. I see them all over the place. This is an older one, but it just it's going to walk through very quickly what's happening. So if you look, there's a bunch of circuitry. There's essentially these two guide wheels inside that control the kind of the buttons, but also this encoder. So the encoder is a little optical encoder that like the light shines through and it detects it with a photodiode on the other side. And this uh, emitter and detector basically look and see if there is an opening or not. And as you turn the wheel, you obviously get this really cool pulse on off on off, right? And so you can tell if the wheel is moving. So when it's high and then later we see it's low, we go, awesome. The wheel is moving. We will register that as one sort of movement position. The reason I'm sort of pointing this out is this, this dictates the, the best resolution you can get out of your input device. So it's important to know how it works because you can't disambiguate until that actual um, change in state. And we can, okay, maybe you could do some software to look at, you know, is it starting to be occluded, but just stick with me with this sort of state change. There's a problem with this because if we spin the wheel the other way, it also goes low. Uh-oh, now we don't know which way it's going. We just know it's moving, right? So <clears throat> what really has to happen is you have to have these two encoders so you can actually tell which direction it's going. And you're watching this kind of um, little bit of an offset because now when it goes from high, high to low, high, that tells you it's moving one direction. And when it goes to high, low, it's the other direction. Many of you may know this already. Many of you might not ever go and take a mouse apart or have to deal with this, but when new kinds of input devices come your way, as an HCI uh, practitioner, these are the kind of questions you should ask. What's going on inside? What's the resolution? How does it disambiguate states and direction or whatever the kind of information is? Okay. And then you can make these encodings. So another thing, when you get an input signal, be it sort of moving left one or right one or whatever it is, is this mapping. So how do we change, how do we map a movement? So the easiest way to think about this is clearly moving a mouse on a screen, but there's other, other ways to think about this. So some pointer is on a screen and your device has now triggered move one to the left. And there's obviously going to be a mapping. Does that mean move one pixel? Does that mean don't move, you know, one tenth of a pixel? What does that actually mean? And so there's this transformation um, of how you actually decide to move this. And it makes, a big, uh, it makes a big design change of how you actually, um, how, your, how your system's actually going to work. So this kind of cursor and uh, sort of device and screen interface resolution and how it actually will be mapped will give you a lot of, um, it's important decision because it'll, trade off how well you can do various resolutions or how the user experience will be. Can you easily move across the whole screen? Um, obviously, I'm not going to talk about every kind of input device. Clearly, optical mice is just a, a picture that shows kind of how they work. And clearly, they're using a little uh, camera in there to kind of optically track motion. They have different ways of distinguishing resolution. Um, similarly, um, this is just a fun project someone did where they actually took the input from the mouse as someone moved around and sort of captured things. But again, back to this issue about what is sensed. So some position movement is going to be mapped to something on the screen. Okay, so some position movement. Now, the way this works is it can either be indirect or direct or this CD ratio. So something that's the input is direct where it's actually aligned. So the CD is this kind of cursor and device. So movement uh, from cursor to display, basically. That ratio is going to be important in terms of how uh, someone controls and interacts with the screen. So 
if you think about it, every one of these has some different mapping, and that's what creates a different user experience. So a trackball uh, might be mapped differently to something like a track point. So these are these force actuated systems that can sort of detect if you're moving or pushing it in one direction or not, at what resolution does it detect that force? When does it start to trigger movement? And how does the mapping occur? Because if the mapping, if the device is sending out something that's not linear and you're doing a, a linear mapping, it creates very um, different experience. On the, on the mobile side, you've seen some of these for pointing. D-pads, these direction pads, were really popular before we went to these screens that we interacted with. And the D-pads let you kind of move back and forth direction up and down a menu, but they were very hard to kind of quickly move freeform around a screen. Track balls or track pads where there was a little kind of positioning, you could have more freeform interaction rather than uh, discrete kinds of uh, directions. And now we have more direct touch and often things with the stylus. Here is an interesting input system I thought I would share. When a fingernail is dragged over the surface of a textured material, such as wood, wall paint, or fabric, it produces a high frequency sound. Although it can often be heard by the naked ear, the signal propagates best through dense materials. Here is an example of this effect with a wood table. This is the sound captured using the camera's built-in microphone. This is the same sound, but captured using a microphone coupled to the table's surface. When writing a multi-part gesture, such as a letter, a finger moves, accelerates, and decelerates in a particular way. This interacts with the textured surface, producing a unique frequency and amplitude profile. Features such as peak count and duration can be extracted, allowing gestures to be classified using a decision tree or other machine learning technique. We can take advantage of these effects to create large, unpowered, and inexpensive finger input surfaces. We detect the transmission of high-frequency sound waves through solid materials by using a stethoscope, which acts as a vibrating diaphragm, and a generic microphone. A high-pass filter is used to remove lower-frequency noises, such as voice, making the sensing significantly more robust. Now let's look at some examples. Here, our sensor is attached to the wall. We use tape, but it could be affixed by more permanent means. It can also be embedded inside the wall or on the reverse side. The audio that you will hear is from our sensor. We repeat this simple double swipe gesture next to the sensor at one meter, four meters, and eight meters away. You can hear the signal is well preserved. This is also true of corners. and doors. Here is a demonstration of a simple audio player application that uses scratch input on a typical home wall. The process signal, current mode, and audio location is shown in the foreground. We can switch between the volume mode and the seek mode by using a V gesture. A single tap acts as a Boolean toggle, switching between increasing or decreasing the volume or seeking forwards or backwards. A continuous circling motion acts as a magnitude control. Amplitude is proportional to the speed of the motion, which allows the magnitude control to have variable speed. A double tap allows the user to pause and resume. All right, so pretty cool, huh? It's like uh, suddenly your whole room is now like an input device, right? Your friends go, I don't like that song. All right, turn it down a little bit. I got it. All right, so th th there's obviously, as usual, there's some problems with this approach, but I want you to take into your thinking that often input devices look very unlike things that you're normally used to seeing. Um, and as it says here, uh, everything is best for something and worse for something else. So that system is really good for the example that Chris showed, but maybe it works very poorly for, you know, CAD modeling, right? That probably wouldn't work so well. One thing that you saw in the reading was a way to actually try to put just common state models with these, and this helps articulate 
what actions are available and how you get you actually get to the range of different um, uh, sort of uh, uh, actions. So here you see, and this was the simple example of when you are moving the mouse, any DX, DY, so any movement, then it's tracking. Device motion moves only the cursor. When you push the button down, you move to state two, and any motion then will be considered dragging. The device move it, uh, moves sort of an object on the screen. When you release it, you go back to state one. I know everyone knows this how a mouse works, but this is how we kind of characterize it because it's important because when you start to think about how a touch screen works, it's a little different. Basically, there's this state where you're kind of out of range. So you're, you're moving, nothing's really happening. Only when you touch do you fall into this other mode, right? So only things uh, where you have to add some other gesture, things like this, maybe this force touch to kind of pop into some other mode. But the key thing is you start to realize what's good and what's bad about particular input devices by looking at these states. So something like a stylus, maybe you do have more of a hover mode where you can kind of tell what's going on and then you kind of uh, can move in and out of range. All right, it's, it's worth saying something about multi-touch again here because it came up briefly before, but multi-touch, even though it's been around a while, it's still pretty new. So literally, um, the first time it was, I mean, it was introduced to people in the early 2000s, but it didn't get a lot of airplay. It wasn't really until the moment that, you know, Steve Jobs went on stage and showed off the new iPhone in 2007. So that's that seven, eight years ago. That's not that long ago that people were blown away by multi-touch. So I found a original little, a little excerpt from the, his original 2007 when he's demonstrating this. And I know you've seen this before, but watch how people react to this like it's magical that no one now would react to. They go, yeah, of course, you can scroll. I get it. But people are like, what is going on? Whoops, I don't want to show that. Yeah. This is more like highlights of a few of the things that he showed and how people just got so amazingly blown away by it. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Here it is. Now, actually, here it is, but we're going to leave it there for now. Okay, so, here, so here's he's showing uh, how to do. People have, people have not seen this before. before. The best point of life in the world. We're going to find a lot of born with one of ten of ten fingers. Stylus is so popular then. Right, can you see that again? He's demoing unlock. That's how exciting it was. Scrolling. No one had seen scrolling. Here it comes. They're applauding scrolling. This is how big of a deal it was only eight years ago. What about pinch to zoom? Wouldn't it be great if you didn't, if you had six voicemails, if you didn't have to listen to five of them first before you wanted to listen to the six? Wouldn't that be great if you had random access voicemail? Well, we got it. Just like email, you can go directly to the voicemails and hit the queue. You can see the uh, buttons change to merge calls right there in the middle, so I just push that right here, and now I create a conference call. So hard to do before these were made commercially available. I can just take my fingers and I can, we call it the pinch. I 
can bring them closer together. Now, no one had seen this on a phone before. And so I can just move them further apart and stretch the image. And move it around. That's it. We've been very lucky to have brought a few revolutionary user All right. So I mainly want to point out that some of these things that you would fi find absurd if someone demoed, like, look, it moves. Look, I'm zooming. You wouldn't get an applause. But it was that remarkable at the time. Um, so it was just amazing to see that in a commercial product. So uh, talking about this, uh, uh, actually, multi-touch, we talked somewhat about some of the problems of how, especially when it's on a large format, it's, you know, doing things where it's, uh, you have a lot of gesture and body motions. Uh, but some things, the direct input allows a maximum screen. Whoa, they just killed my thing again. That's clearly them upstairs doing something, right? That's all right. I have the technology to redo that. Plus, I know what my, my slide said anyway, so we don't have to kill uh, time. So... Let me just move on. So come back. It's turning on, so we'll, we'll get there. So some challenges are that there's not often with multi-touch tactile feedback, right? So that's one of the things that we talked about with keyboards that were important. Uh, it sometimes requires, when it's larger, multi-hands, so, or it's hard to distinguish who is touching it. So you can actually do multi-touch often doesn't distinguish if it's one or two people. Now, the technology has been done to do that, but it's not often implemented in our individual devices. And then we have, as brought up before, the fat finger problem, right? So we have that as a problem. Um, so the end part of this is what I wanted to talk about, these different kinds of gestures. So people basically de designed not just touching. When they decided there were going to be screen-based inputs with fingers or stylus, particularly with fingers, they experimented a lot with what gestures would make sense. Um, and there's been entire vocabularies developed around that. In fact, some of them make more or less sense depending on the context, but you can use them. And I'm going to show you an example of at least, these are just some uh, multi-point gestures that people came up with in terms of drawing or rotating your finger or, you know, two fingers or four fingers. And now there's so many mappings, what usually happens is it's hard to remember them um, some of them are more or less, they're not as established. I want to show you some, an interesting kind of body interaction. So this is more of a demo, it's not sort of, here is a word processor, but it makes different sounds based on the shape that you make with your hand. Any closure. So it's all right. So that was some very cool work by Golan Levin, who's a really uh, amazing new media artist. But he's done a lot with thinking about new kinds of input devices, and this was his kind of visual exploration of like maybe things you put into a scene, they take on a new kind of way you can read them and interpret them, either as music or other things. Um, so. 
let me try to wrap up. We have about 10 minutes. I have just a tiny bit more. We, I want to make sure that we emphasize, we've talked about this multiple times, but lots of these touch input devices suffer from this fat finger problem that we brought up, brought up repeatedly. Um, and it also dictates how you might want to design these systems. So uh, the obvious thing is where, when you put your finger down, are you actually touching, right? I don't know. What's the right answer? Are you touching directly what's underneath? Are you something else? Is it some projected thing? So what happens, right? So often you've seen uh, some interfaces, if you actually select, it just says, I'm gonna throw up another display that I know you can see to help you resolve the ambiguity, right? It helps you do fine precision because it's very challenging. But people have done a lot of work to figure this out. So what's another solution? The, the obvious question is you want to push on something, but you once you put your finger down, you can't see it. We're aware that you could offset it or do something else, but what's another strategy you could use? This is like really one of these thinking outside the, the box questions. So if I'm, uh, I'm holding this and I'm, I'm touching it and I want to select something, but my finger covers it, where else could I touch it and still transmit information about where I'm touching? The back. I could basically be touching the back. Right? Why can't I touch the back? Select by, pu select by pushing on the back and drag things around. There's no occlusion problems and suddenly your fat fingers have gone on a diet and no longer are a problem. Cool, huh? So again, there's, there's problems with all of these approaches, but I want you to realize that people have thought really hard about creative solutions, about how you can get around some of these things. And this was one of them, uh, Patrick Bowdish and, and did. Um, I'll show you uh, a couple other uh, inputs, I think. It's two or three here. So I don't know if we need the like techno music going here. Okay, so they're, they're showing you a mouse that has essentially um, a detection unit for actually sensing where you're touching with multiple fingers. So you can see there's a camera image of how you're touching it. So now it's not just hitting a single button, but it lets you have very different control over touching or interacting with actual objects. So they'll show you uh, interaction with surface computing application on a desktop. So the idea is rather you can use it as a regular mouse, but when you use your fingers, you can actually not just have gestures, but you can also have multi-touch on this. Now, some mice have this. This was basically 2008, 2009. So it was, it was fairly unusual at the time, but you can see there's pinching and zooming. These were things that were really hard to do on a, on a mouse like that. And I'll show you a couple more. Uh, Chris Harrison's been really um, doing a lot of cool work in this space, so he has a couple interesting. Our approach seeks to occupy the space between these two extremes, offering some of the flexibility of touch screens while retaining the beneficial tactile properties of physical interfaces. Our displays are constructed from several layers of specially cut acrylic. These form an air. So what's happening there is he's using the advantages of soft keyboards that suddenly appear, and you can actually decide what to display. But then you want to generate these buttons, and they might need to be positioned at different places. So you need not a static, rigid button configuration, but these buttons would pop up and become visible, maybe only some of them at a time. So you, um, and then you would be able to get the tactile experience of touching the buttons, and he has it sort of projected on what the, what the display would be. So, show you another one of these. This is Abracadabra. I'm Chris Harrison. I'm going to talk about Abracadabra, an input technique for very small mobile devices. One's too small for practical touchscreen use, and with limited room to accommodate physical buttons. Instead, we take interaction off of the device and into the unused surrounding area. This not only provides a larger area for input, but also reduces occlusion of the screen from fingers. We achieve this interaction by employing a two-axis magnetometer operating behind the display 
and a small magnet, which is worn on the finger, or potentially integrated to the tip of a stylus. This configuration provides a high accuracy and wireless means to interact with very small devices. Furthermore, magnets can penetrate cleaning materials and never have to be recharged. I will now talk about some of the example interactions enabled by our technique. The first method, for which the magnetic sensors we use are particularly well suited, is rotational input. This, quite simply, calculates a bearing to the magnet on the finger. We use this functionality in two distinct ways. The first is to support angular buttons with fixed locations. The second way is to use rotation to navigate lists. Clockwise to scroll down, count the time. So one thing you'll notice is he's getting rid of all the occlusion problems because all the interactions are happening outside of the screen space because he's using this uh, uh, using a magnetometer to detect that magnetic field. Now, the clear, obviously, you got to wear this little magic ring. You lose the ring, now you're, you know, not going to work for you. Um, but it's interesting to think about this mapping now where it's not directly one-to-one -one on the screen, but you're able to actually control things. Here he's sort of spinning the volume up and down. Um, imagine that gesture is possibly a little more intuitive than scrolling something on a screen. All right, I think I've got one more here to show you. Hi. Hi, Chris. We saw you a minute ago. How's it going? However, we don't want to carry around extra surfaces, especially for input. In my research, I think about clever ways to appropriate surfaces that are already around us, like tables and walls. In this video, I'm going to talk about SkinFoot, a bioacoustic sensing technology that allows our body to be used as a large finger input surface. It doesn't require any electronics to be placed on the skin. When a finger taps the skin, the impact creates an ensemble of useful acoustic signals. When slowed down 14 times, we can see transverse waves on the skin's surface. However, complex longitudinal waveforms also propagate through the body. To capture these signals, we developed a special purpose bioacoustic sensing array. Variations in bone density, size and mass, as well as filtering effects from soft tissues and joints mean different locations are acoustically distinct. Software we develop listens for impacts and classifies them. Different interactive capabilities can be bound to different locations. Here we see a user playing a game of Tetris using their fingers as a control pad. In our prototype system, we chose to focus on impact for the arms and hands and developed an armband for sensing. In our user study, we evaluated several input location sets, which demonstrated our approach could achieve accuracies as high as 95.5% for five locations, a sufficient number of buttons for many mobile interactions. Segmenting purposeful input from false positives is robust and remains functional while walking and jogging. Many uses are possible. Consider, for example, an audio player strapped to the arm, which could be controlled by taps to one's fingers. It is also possible to incorporate a Pico projector into the armband already situated on the upper arm. This allows for not only sensing, but also projection of a dynamic graphical interface. Here, the system renders a series of buttons on the wearer's forearm. Users can simply click the desired function with their finger. This interface is hierarchical, allowing the user to access a wide range of potential functionality. As you can see, finger inputs are segmented and classified in real time. Alternatively, we developed a scrolling-based interface. Here, the user taps on the top or bottom. OK, so you see this is yet another interesting, now your body becomes part of the interface. And it goes all the way back to what we talked about, even with the mouse, which seemed boring, which is, What's the limitations? Like this device works great, but it's all driven by taps. You can't do drags. You can't do multi-point pinch and gestures, which is fine. It just means that interfaces for this need to rely on tapping and taps and those kinds of uh, interactions. OK, you've seen the future. It's coming to your arm and hand and body. Um, so uh, that's all I've got today. We're going to basically section this week, as I mentioned, it's Framer and a bunch of other things. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing graphic design. More stuff will go out, and we'll be closing in on uh, just uh, two more weeks. You, oh, one other thing, let me just say, and I'll put this on Piazza. Some people said, 
when what's going on with our actual final project some people panicked because they had to hand stuff in today and they were like uh oh i picked something this might not be what you know i'm into i kind of went with whatever this is what we're going to say uh i would expect you could easily throw away all the ideas or certainly the top three and find something totally new still so don't feel like you're locked into those we wanted you to pick some um i would say by the end of next week you should have definitely the candidate ones that you want. So I would say don't be inserting new ideas by the end of next week. So have, if it's two or three, at least you're down to those three. And by the following week, you should have picked, and in fact, we're gonna force you to tell us what at least your, your topic is with not a ton of detail, at least we'll force you to sort of pick one of the ideas so you'll know what you're actually working on. So you're still in the open space of brainstorming. You can still, if something comes to you, we don't, we didn't, we didn't look at leaf blowers at all. Let's try to design some interface around leaf blowers with the water. You still lost time for doing that, but get it on the candidate list, meet with your group, say, Hey, let's add these. Let's some of that we discarded on the 50. I want to bring those back up, have it down to the three that you think are definitely one of those are the final ones by the end of next week and then we'll have you pick the final one. That's the strategy um, in terms of what we want as a deadline. All right, have a great weekend. Have a good time in the section tomorrow. Thanks everyone.